Otherwise, I'm, I'm locked in my house. And so it's a challenge to be creative. That's one of the things I wanted to talk about with you, especially that you're in Seattle and there's a whole bunch of stuff happening there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, creativity and um, overwhelmed go hand to hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, do you think you become more creative or more overwhelmed or both in, uh, in lockdown? Uh, I would say it goes back and forth like a continuum because there are lots of ideas but then from the idea to being able to manifest it uh -huh. there's a lot of sources that come through yeah. and then i have a tendency of of getting very excited about things so i lose track of where i was going so i have mm -hmm. to have discipline to say like okay what is what i really really want to do and uh, so i don't get distracted and and so every day is meaningful to me yeah so you, you're getting a lot more ideas about really everything and so you have to kind of like weed through and pick out the good ones and then so oh, yeah. Yeah, that, and that's the one i'm going to do and the rest of you just go away Yes, that's that's a skill when again. I'm I'm not I'm figuring out how to weed my ideas because I have many. <laughs> I know this. Having having yeah. uh, worked with you for some time, not a lot of time, but you know, a couple of years. Yeah, and I get very excited about uh like I I can I can see it through, but when I get into collaborations I not necessarily know how to explain where I'm going. And because I'm a mover, I tend to just like go and mm -hmm. just being very independent. And then I realize that I cannot do it alone. Uh, so it's a, also like a uh, back and forth, back and forth into which ideas can be done and grow by itself. Yeah. A seeds very slowly and then you take care of them, they grow. And others that if you put or collaborate with somebody, then they will grow faster. Yeah. Or yeah. or it's more clear or it will it will um spread to more people. Yeah. So So collaborating in real time, you know, in the same space. Not not necessarily being together, but being in the same mental space. You can really uh you think you can grow the ideas more or get get a better i don't know fertility maybe mm. are you are you saying of being like in a physical space well not well that's kind of one of the problems is that we can't just get together i mean yeah. you and i have great physical distance but now that we're i don't think that we're still allowed to say gather in a space and start working on creative projects together i don't know what the situation in seattle is but like there's no dancing happening here like you can't you can't get together at least with strangers you can't really work together so well i guess what i'm asking is is it hindering your creative process to have that separation or do you think that it's creating more pressure to make that necessary Ooh. that's a great question mm. thank you yeah, because I think I have shifted my creativity and my projects to be able to fit in the new reality. Like, for mm -hmm. example, the teaching dance that is no longer available in a dance studio. Right. Like, I had to teach it online. It was not an option. Like, right. students would sign up. University was offering the program. It was not an option. So I like had to dive in. Yeah. So the creativity, I guess it was connected with the necessity and then yeah. it shifted. But other projects like, for example, my website, which yeah. I should be more creative about that and then more proactive about that. Right. It was left behind because I was suddenly like, 
trying to solve problems and creativity uh, issues for other people. Right. So that's another thing, like the difference between being creative for yourself and being creative um, about your work or about your life or circumstances, but kind of like the creativity of um, like your art and your evolution, that's kind of different. Like I have to approach it. For example, have to meditate more. Like I felt the need of just being in the morning quiet look for help right and that is keeping me sane yeah so that's kind of another kind of creativity to keep my own like internal dancing going mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so to so answer your question i believe that there's the the physical space is not necessary per se right you just had to adapt to the, the new conditions. And then it sounds like a whole lot of things happened immediately that, well, this is the new reality. So you had to start working from a different perspective, but utilizing the, the space that you had, or the, the tools that you had, right? Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that myself too. Like I was pretty much immediately determined that I needed to sit more, you know, meditate more, put, put more internal work in. And man, it was like chaos. Like, it was like, that didn't, that only helped me to realize, oh my God, I'm, I'm living in chaos now, you know? And I, I thought it would be easier, like, okay, I have to stay home, so I'm just gonna have all my little projects and, you know, like be very meticulous because I have more time to spend here. No, it wasn't like that. It was like, ah, what am I gonna do? <laughs> it was just like spinning wheels all the time. So yeah, it was, it was difficult. Yeah. But definitely creative mm. creativity was necessary. The creative thought and creative process was like the, the driving force, you know? Mm. Yes. So how about you, about creativity? Like where, where, where are you going to with it? Well, um, I, you know, it's, like I said, it's been kind of chaotic. So I really felt like, well, I need to go back to my music and I need to focus more on, you know, the, the meta dance, like the things that inspire me to, to make dance art and, and music for dance and, you know, different scenarios. So, um, so immediately just had to reorient to doing live projects online, you know, through Zoom with groups, you know, different places. And surprisingly, like, so Nadine has a lot of students all over. And so, you know, we have people in Hawaii and people in Chicago and people in California, just all like joining and doing these projects. It was amazing because you can't do that in normal, you know, dance space. You're just all in the room and that's it. But now we have like constantly have people all over the country and that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, but generally, you know, it's like, I feel this pressure to like, get done with this and go back to normal life. And I realize there isn't going to be quite the same normal. So now it's sort of this blending of cyber world and circumstantial world and how to apply our creative energy to those things. So the process is, I mean, we're only two months into this, so or three months into it. So who knows how long it'll take to, you know, stabilize it. I know. That's a question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was like, that was the first question I wrote to you, which I have put on my handy phone right here was <laughs> how creative, how will creative efforts change the way we look at the world as it is now? Mm -hmm. Or how, how will it enhance it? Mm. Right now, what comes to mind is that I feel that we're more present because we're at home and we're posing those questions on ourselves. Mm. Of what, what am I going to do, right? Before COVID, we were just doing 
and like there was some momentum going. And with these clear cut of, of uh, circumstances, then suddenly, oh, since we, we see the barrier very clear or clear in terms of the virus or the inequality. Yeah. So we are forced to have time to rethink. And it, in, in my opinion, is just how now we communicate with each other to like, I guess like consciousness now needs to kick in and say like how conscious we are about what we're rebuilding. So we are not rebuilding the same stuff that got us into this mess. Um, mm -hmm. And I think communication is key. I had a meditation uh, practice with my teacher that actually what you were saying about like connecting with people from different places. Yeah. So he's in India and he oh. has like many students from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And he's teaching just this our practices in the morning to center people just to and he was saying that relationships are key to change because um for example if we know to how to explain ourselves or how to explain what we need clearly there's no yeah. confusion uh, yeah. and relationships are key like when like father, mother, or like husband, wife, or friend to friend, or boss to employee. Like sometimes we're hiding stuff or we don't know how to explain it. And that's where like all the subconscious starts to get into like blah, lots of um, ideas are not clearly explained because of many reasons, like for guilt or for shame or for, mm -hmm like our upbringings. So he made me realize that communication, obviously, it's yeah. super in, in important in order to not just come back to normal, but come back and be better, be more like resilient now. Because mm -hmm. it would be dumb to just go back to normal like, as if nothing happened. Mm. So, so the landscape, the, the, the landscape of change in the world has, in terms of human, the human world has mostly to do with relationships and how, uh, how, how this situation is changing them in, in, in the way that it is changing them. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So we have entered a portal, <laughs> a change portal. Yeah. Well, that, that's interesting because I, I haven't really discussed that much about how, you know, everybody's lives when they go back to so-called normal, how relationships have changed. I've, I've heard a lot of interesting stories about how like divorce courts are very busy right now <laughs> because people are forced to be with each other now uh, at home. And probably uh, conversely a lot of a lot of relationships that were on shaky legs are getting better now um, yeah. so yeah those there's those those domestic relationships and then there's also like you and I have an artistic relationship that you know has been sort of on hold for the last I don't know 10 years or something but <laughs> yes <laughs> but uh, yeah I mean we've been communicating recently and it's like suddenly we're forced into that, not forced, but we're, we're enticed to connect and sort of share this, these ideas again, you know, and, uh, coming back after a 10 year hiatus. And yeah. And I think it's a, the, the way that we connect, the way that we continue connecting. Because if you and me get together and say like, oh, I just, this is horrible, fuck this, fuck that. Or mm -hmm. we spent our time more like, you know, uh, I don't know, like blaming state. Mm -hmm. That's totally fine. There's no, nothing wrong with that. But in a sense, are we, are we moving forward? Mm -hmm. And uh, just the fact that you created this pod, or like podcast or like interviewing people. Actually, I want to say to you that you inspire me. 
You want to say why? You want to know why? Yeah, I want to know why. Why do I inspire? <laughs> okay. I since I am um, since since little, I love asking questions. For some reason, just asking questions just it's fun. <laughs> and um, but awesome. for a while, people criticize me a little bit because I ask too much too much questions or too many questions. Mm -hmm. into like oh why are you interested what do you want to know about myself right so to make the story short my mom is one of those people who would say like oh no, no don't ask too much it's just like just be right yeah. Yeah. Uh, but and then I decided to embrace my curiosity and uh -huh. say I'm gonna interview my mom <laughs> why not it's like yeah. why you don't like me to, to to go further to go deeper right and I ended up interviewing her last week and I made like a bunch of questions and it was delightful oh like, yeah about connections it's like who do you want to connect the most with your parents right. because that's gonna heal you in some way it's gonna go back well, those, those are your primary relationships. Since we're talking about changing relationships in this case, uh, you went right for the, right for the mother. <laughs> so yeah. you're a brave soul, Deanna. <laughs> <laughs> and I told her like, you know, mom, if the questions are too much or you don't want to answer them, just say so. But I feel compelled at just asking them. Mm -hmm. So and your mom, Mexico, so. Mm -hmm. Your mom is in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So you called her up, or you did a Zoom, or you just yes, we did a Zoom. Yeah. Nice. Like this, yeah. Nice. Uh, I haven't gotten brave enough to interview, interview my parents yet, but uh, yeah, one of these days. Yeah, I would say it's powerful. Did you learn anything about her? A lot of things. Hmm. That was great. My, my stepdad, I used to ask a lot of questions too. My stepdad used to ask, he'd, he'd say, are you, what are you writing a book? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I could be like, yeah, eventually I'm going to write a book and you're going to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Well, that's good. I, that's, that's actually, you know, the, crea the creative process has so much to do with these early relationships and you know, they, they launch you in life. So it's like, what are you, what are you doing? Well, you can kind of attribute your path in life to these first few years where you were learning what human beings are and what, what we do, what we're doing here, so. Yeah. It's funny because the, that's another thing, like, I don't know if you wanna, know more about movement or dance but the more i know about people the more i see dance like just the simple activity of dance mm -hmm. as like how can i use dance tools that um create fluidity that create flow that create balance how can I use those tools for communication? Like, how can we dance together? That's kind of always been my, my thing. Like, how can, how can I dance a collaboration that everybody's in flow? Because being in flow is like so delicious. Uh, yeah. Like in performance, we're in flow. In, um, I don't know, when you're with your partner and you're having delicious connection, then you're in flow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yeah. all that is like, is that possible with the relationships? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, relationships change. In my opinion, relationships change a lot if you introduce uh, intentional movement. You know, rather than like nonverbal things are uh, so much more immediate. Like you really get feedback about a person's stability and their their 
tendencies and intentions and things when you when you move with them through space you know or even you know touching if you're not into contact improv you can just dance without touching but you know, that also <laughs> changes the changes the flow like you said very much mm-hmm. and that's kind of what your like your educational track and your uh your um you know, your commercial existence in the world is all about dance right so you're you're doing that for your your life yeah it's more about movement because it's not necessarily about dance like yeah i'm questioning what's dance so movement it's more neutral for me yeah yeah i I think that's the general that's the catch-all for most uh people i know who are making these sorts of efforts it's we're talking about movement uh, Mm -hmm. because there's a connection between movement and the mind that isn't necessarily articulated through your whole educational track right oh yeah absolutely yeah i think that the more it's more visible like dance is more visible now see now i'm I'm making the connection dance is more visible what you see what what it has music what it has like a story or deep emotion but movement is the more internal what we carry and how we organize the energy in order to explain it to the outside. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It makes, well, it makes sense to me. Um, but that's very well articulated, you know, uh, organizing, organizing or reorganizing the energy. You first have to perceive that energy and that movement in yourself. So, um, you know, uh, I wish we had a bigger screen so we could move in this in this uh, <laughs> context because we're just like talking heads, just like everybody. <laughs> but you know, I know. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, that kind of comes to the next point. I keep having to unlock my phone here. Um, why do you dance, really, and and what happens to you when you're dancing? So we could just supplant the word dancing to moving. Why, why do you move? Yeah. I guess we can work parallel since we, we pointed out both. So why? So first, why do I dance? Mm. Because I connected with the discipline since a very young age. So it became my second nature. Mm. And why do I move? Um... First, it's a need, and then it's a way for me to discover the world in a way because of like being kinesthetic, being more visual. Mm. Um, Yeah, so it's something that was taught to me that enabled me to communicate at the deeper level with myself and with others. And then it's also helping me to express deeper. Does that make sense? Yeah. So obviously expression to you goes beyond language and beyond sort of the subjective idea communication it's more of a like you said a deeper level so Mm -hmm. deeper meaning deeper into yourself or deeper meaning more profound in a just a general sense like Mm -hmm. you're tapping into some ocean that flows between us that we can't see Mm -hmm. yeah i think both yeah yeah, lately I've been learning how like we can expand horizontally and we can expand kind of like upwards mm-hmm. and downwards in depth. So it's more like because the the medium of dance doesn't really have boundaries 
unless yeah. you see it. No, the medium of movement doesn't have boundaries unless you see it as a dance, mm. which, which becomes like it has many styles or many um, rules. So when it comes to the world and becomes dance, then it has many, yeah, m many rules, right? Mm -hmm. But in movement, when it stays in movement, it doesn't, it's very, it's very phoneless. Yeah. And um, that helps not just to communicate non-verbally, but I guess, like I've been, I don't know, you guys, you and Nadine, but there, there's people who like to move and they're engineers and there are people who like to move and they are uh, doctors, right? So there's this deeper sense of getting to know your body. Right. And dance from the outside, it's the window. Or yoga, yeah. for example, is the window that draws you in to know more about your body. Or like maybe anything that it's body, body related. Uh, right. sports right but do we like sometimes we stop at learning the skill mm -hmm. and that richer content mm -hmm. that could help you be a better writer or or a more uh, more holistic writer or a more um, uh, or to work well with your body in terms of like constructing, right? Yeah. So those benefits of learning to know how to dance, how, know how to move mm -hmm. are bigger and they don't, they're not necessarily seen mm -hmm. by people. And therefore people don't, or, or individuals or people in general, don't see the need to pay attention to the, to the deeper levels of the body or the body mind, mind connection. Right. Right. Ooh. So if you're taking it out of the framework of like purpose driven movement, like, like you mentioned sports, you know, you have to be in physical condition and really, you know, know how to keep your eye on the ball. So we're talking about baseball, you know, and the movements are all about, you know, purpose or, you know, even running, it's just like very, very strict parameters to get where you're going, you know, and then if you just take it out of those frameworks and you just let the body move how it moves, you get into some areas of like consciousness that you may have heretofore not been aware of, you know, and that's, that's kind of an interesting situation mm -hmm. when you first come to it. Um, like just trying something that's not a not a purpose driven movement, not something that's very cultural, you know. It's just about the framework that of the instrument that you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you feel that uh, dancers are more risk takers in general, or movers are risk takers? Uh, well, I think it's mixed. I think if we're talking about in general, like movers, I mean, yeah, people, I mean, if, well, if you think about like, uh, I think it was Steppenwolf, uh, Herman Hesse, um, like he, he had to kind of come out of his shell and go to a dance and, you know, be in a, outside of the context of his normal life was going to you know a party and a dance and being you know more engaged that way so there's a sort of a philosophical connotation of coming out of you know the whatever I've been told to do or what I'm compelled to do to do my job or whatever and so yeah I would say if, if I identify as a mover that's somebody who's gone beyond the the norms of society and decided to do something just because you know <laughs> so in general i would say yes but there are there are certain groups of dancers and movers who are really about the rules you know this is how you do swing dance and this is how you do you know any sort of cultural dancing especially like uh 
like Balkan dancing. I, I tried that a few times and it's like, there are too many rules in that, you know, and <laughs> people really like those like type A dancers, you know, they just really love to, those steps, you know, do 19 this way and five this way and put your thumb up and, you know, it's like, yeah, uh -huh. fell down when I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like I need a lifetime to learn this style and I need a lifetime to learn the other style. Sure. Yeah. And that that's another aspect of the mind. It's just, you know, learning the learning the material is a very specific application of your mind, you know. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that that's that's going in a different direction than what we tend to talk about movers, you know. Uh when I started doing the, like the ecstatic dances are, are fun because it's just like, just go in there and do whatever. You can lay on the floor if you want and don't move at all. Um, that's still, um, that's still uh, okay in that game, you know? Uh huh. What was your experience in the, the ecstatic dance? Like the first time you went? First time I went, I was really upset that they wouldn't let me in after nine o'clock. And I made a big stink. I was like, are you kidding me? Like I got down here, I paid my 10 bucks, you know, I'm going to dance. And I pushed my way in because they have a, you know, a container, build a container. It's like the container is open until this point and then the container is closed. And I was yeah. like, bullshit, I'm going in there. <laughs> and and you um, went in there? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, it took me a while before I was brave enough to show up at the beginning because I thought it was a real kind of a hippy dippy thing that, you know, wasn't for me. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of like, ah, this isn't my scene. So I'd come late and leave early, you know, and eventually I just ended up going habitually because it felt so good to move for two hours without any sort of rules you know i mean sometimes the music wasn't to my liking i'd just go outside and breathe the fresh air come back in dance some more you know but the the interesting thing in the connection i'll just say a little more about the ecstatic dance is that the connection with myself started getting a lot more stronger when i would just be there for me and just be there to have my own experience of moving you know, other people can see, but it's like, I don't care. You know, I'm just, I'm here really enjoying this uh, container that was built for this experience. So I came yeah. around. I stopped being so uh, shy about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I always love how you're a dancer and a musician. Yeah, I love that too. Well, I mean, music was my first um, application of creativity, I would say. It was the first thing. It was really like, I'm doing this thing because it's so wonderful. It's, you know, perfect expression. It's technical and it's all these things. But dancing is below that. It's like dancing almost was like, like not dancing, moving, let's say, you know, grooving was the mother to the music and absolutely so i'm asking my mom the questions now you know like what is this what is this why am i doing this yeah i think it's super healthy interview your mother <laughs> <laughs> did you did you find any clues to your your passions uh, about dance and movement from that interview uh this first interview no because the questions were more about mother daughter mm. how we see each other but definitely i'm going to ask her more about my tendencies when i was a kid why i connected with this and not other things mm -hmm. definitely yeah it's going to take several interviews i think <laughs> i know i i made a whole list because I have um, a chart that I have always wanted to use. It says like, it's from a nutrition school that I, I took a cleanse from. Uh, I think I, maybe I can bring it to you because it's useful. It's, it, it's called 
a balanced life. So it's a like a pie with different the different sections, and one is your relationship, and the other one is your like home cooking or uh, finance. I want to bring it to you because I think it's really interesting. I want to use it more, so maybe you can give me a little bit more of uh, usages. Wait a second. Sure, sure, sure. So I, I gather questions for my mom from all these areas. Can you see it? Yeah, okay, circle of life. If you can back it out a little bit, it'll come up in focus. Yeah, so what are those words around the outside? Those are not readable. It's like Shakti and... Oh yeah, I was just categorizing them as more active energy or passive energy. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Shiva and Shakti. Yeah. So what is the squiggly line in the middle? Oh, that's the, the, that's the trick. It's an exercise where you go around and you notice like you can put a dot, like if your spirituality is high and you're mm -hmm. in that point of your life, then you put it high. But for example, if your creativity is low, like for some reason, you go low. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that your life is nice and circly because all the points will be high. Your spirituality, your joy, your relationships, your home, and home environment, right? Mm -hmm. But look at this, like mine, was uh -huh. far <laughs> at that time, far from uh, a wheel. Right. So this is a, a, a picture of change in your life then. Exactly. And yeah. apparently my career was in the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hopefully that's changing. Yeah, that's definitely changing. I see. I, I find it useful to see it very graphically. Yeah. And uh, just kind of like to test ourselves into where do I need to pay more attention? Right, right. Yeah, so it's good to do exercises like that and when you're asking those questions of yourself. And um, that's, a, that's, you know, that's one relationship that really becomes clear definitely during this quarantine time is, is like my relationship with myself, you know, it's, it's like in my face all the time now because I'm by myself pretty much all the time, you know. Um, so, yeah, things, graphing things out like that would be really helpful, I think, for me to do. Because, you know, I've done a lot of exercise where I've just been, been mapping out, you know, like everything I learned every year of my life or, you know, who I was with or what I was doing in school or whatnot, you know. And it's always like, it's always been very helpful to have a graphic or an exercise that just answers these questions mm -hmm. so you've gotten more clarity on all of this uh cycle of change definitely and by creating the questions for my mom mm -hmm. it's as if i want to learn about myself right but i mm -hmm. By learning about my mom, I learn about myself. Oh, yeah. So if I find that my career, like, well, this was like five years ago or so. Mm -hmm. My career is not as I would like it to be. Who's the best person that can advise me? Right? Somebody mm -hmm. who knows you from like way, way deep. Yeah. So it's, it's the possibility that my mother could help me 
not necessarily because she knows exactly what to say, but because through our conversation, we can find that together. And I can do that for her as well. Right. Right. So yeah, making that, making that connection is a big bonus. <laughs> you can, uh, if you're on good terms with your parents, I think it's a good time to really connect and yeah. and make, make those uh, conversations happen for sure. Yeah. And she's, so, she's sick. So in another way, it's like, I know that there are maybe not many years. Um, like there are not many years to be with her, so yeah. I don't know. How often do you get to see her? Twice a year. Mm. But now I guess I don't know. Maybe nothing at all. <laughs> uh, is it? Uh, it's probably impossible to fly right now to to Mexico anyway and come back without much difficulty, huh? Yeah. Probably, I, I think I will be able to go there, but is it, it's maybe not responsible, like in terms of, like if I have something, or I contract something and I bring it to Mexico, or I get sick there and I bring the sickness here, it's tricky. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's putting it lightly. I think it's very tricky. I mean, I'm considering, going to California uh, for a couple of weeks and um, I, j I start to get cold feet. Like, ah, uh, I'm not even gonna try that <laughs> right now. You, know? mm. um, you mean taking a plane? Yeah, mm -hmm. take a plane, drive back. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, uh, what can I say? Um, you're, yeah, you know, my, my parents are driving around in a big RV and I have, I have the, the distinct feeling like I really need to make those connections now. Um, so that, thanks. I'm going to call my mom right after this interview. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Uh, you can do this, what you're doing with me. See, you're inspiring me. Now you're inspiring yourself. Start with that. Yeah, well... Mm -hmm. That's the idea is inspiration was the inspiration for this, this podcast, podcast, whatever this is, this interview, project. <laughs> it's inspiration, you know, and that's, that's what we need in this time when I feel like the international relations are breaking down, the country's on fire, there's race riots going on, it feels like, well, let's think about inspiring each other in a positive way and asking the hard questions. Absolutely. Kind of the opposite of blaming and saying you did this or you, you're you know, at fault or whatever. It's like, what is, what is driving you? What's, what do you want? You know? Yeah. Like really listening. Yeah. Yeah. I, got, I don't know you, but I, I get very exhausted when I am angry. I mm. noticed that. Oh yeah. Like after like arguing with, with Howard, I'm like, I'm done. Like, I want to take a nap. I don't want to do anything else. Yeah. So yeah. I, in a sense, I question myself, like, do I want to be in that space? Not because anger is not necessary at times, no. but maybe we are smarter than that. Well, nothing like a good old angry outburst to just, put things all in question in, in, in your own relationship to yourself too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. totally. A thing. Yeah. Or use the anger, no? like what we talk about in, in Bhutto, like use the anger, use the sorrow, use the darkness. Yeah. And then you go into a delicious dilemma or a delicious uh, cry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And use that, you use that uh, emotional situation. Well, we got about five more minutes. So maybe since you mentioned Buto, we could end on that. Like, uh, is now is everything Buto on hold in Seattle? Is there no yeah, getting together and doing anything with the uh, mm. peeps there? 
Performance wise, yes. But at Daipan, we have been doing, well, we have done one podcast. No, it's not podcast, a uh, webinar. Mm -hmm. And it was really good because Joan, Sherry, me, Helen, and Karu just invited people to have a conversation about Bhutto and what's Bhutto and what was our perspective on Bhutto. Uh -huh. And uh, the conversation was really, really interesting. And they asked for more. But right now, like everybody's dealing with their circumstances and just we, we haven't get, got there yet again mm -hmm. to do another one that's more dance wise. Um, even though we have time, maybe like since everybody's figuring out their lives, there's not dancing happening yet. Oh, no, wait a second. There was on Earth Day, uh, we said that we, we were going to invite people and us also dance in nature and then post videos. So we did that. Oh. Nice. Uh-huh. So nature uh, factors heavily in Bhutto dance, would you say? Oh yeah, definitely. I would say the source. The right. Source. So, <laughs> so perhaps that's the first, the primary relationship then is is the uh, I don't know, creation. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if. You, if if we can really say much about that, but I, I noticed here, like where nature is really right outside the door, like for hundreds of miles around here, there's just nature and nothing else. Um, and my, my sense of movement has completely deepened because of that, because of this full immersion in nature. Mm -hmm. um, so being locked in the house isn't really true. It's not really what's happening. It's just being forced to be out here in this natural environment and watch what happens. It's a great teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost as if we're patient enough. The teaching enter enters our body. Hmm. And then we're moved. Instead of us making the movement. Right. So you mentioned listening earlier and yeah, that's kind of the essence of listening, right? Just being patient, not putting pressure on the inside of you. Uh, I know. But it's so hard, do you think? Just being oh, patient. It's one of the hardest things, I think. <laughs> Anything with <laughs> try to be patient. Like I want it to happen now. Yeah. That's the era of I want this to happen now and, and well and with the whole thing without any effort. Yeah. Instead of the opposite, it's just like, see it grow, enjoy the process. Don't think in the goal. <laughs> yeah. Um, connect with others. Uh, learn from your experience. Ah. So is there, is there one like kind of like that, that's really all the same thing. It's a sort of a presence or a, I mean, I, I, I look at it as, a, as attention. Like attention is the thing that makes me either impatient or patient, you know, with my, with my girlfriend, with my, myself with my life all these things are just like where is where is my focus right now and that that being patient's really about being with that focus and like under, understanding that it's there or not you know mm -hmm. so if i let my ideas drive everything that's out the window i'm not i can't mm -hmm. engage nature or, or really anything very well yeah so would you say that presence present and attention will be in the same, like they mean the same, or they live in the same realm. In terms of my handle on it, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, 
I mean, it takes different forms. It's a different experience from moment to moment, but overall, it's the same thing. You know, um, but it's difficult to describe. You know, if you say it's this, then it's you've already, you know, brought the focus down to this tiny point, and um, so so more the experience of just. You know, uh, I mean, this is my personal experience of it, but uh, I think it rings true with a lot of folks said that, you know, once you get into understanding what your attention is, then you could work on that for the rest of your life. Um, and that's it. You know, everything else is just stuff happening and, you know, you engaging or disengaging from things. Yeah. Yeah, attention. And attention inward and outward would you say that that's also so attention in the object or in the activity but also double attention on uh, how this is affecting you yeah. it's almost like yeah first we have we can have attention but then that attention starts to flourish as well say more about that um let me give you an example because well, we have little time little time uh oh let's see you grab your phone it can be automatic automatically ding ding you check something right. because you're so used to right or right. you grab your phone now you're you have the attention is like oh i grabbed my phone do i really need it probably not and then you put it down. Mm -hmm. Or you can go further and just like, automatically you grab with your phone, you notice that you do this constantly and say like, yes, I'm doing constantly, but right now I need to call my mom. And that's gonna make me feel good because I know that she's struggling. Okay, I'm gonna call my mom, right? Yeah. Uh, which, Without attention, I will grab my phone, not knowing mm -hmm. why I, I'm going to grab it. I'm going to open it. I'm going to check my Facebook. I'm going to read five uh, entries on Facebook, not knowing why I'm reading the Facebook. Then start feeling uncomfortable in my body because I'm in, the, in a weird position looking at my phone. Mm -hmm. And then having to let go of my phone because that was not productive at all. And I felt that in five minutes or 10 minutes, I did nothing. So my attention was gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you were engrossed in whatever was happening here. My, exactly. You, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what we have to work on is uh, actually JP Sears, the sort of the the satirical hippie guy uh he does some serious videos too and one of them is about this thing and he's like what is your intention when you pick it up so your intention is sort of a it's an attentional thing but it's a resolve um and that we could talk for hours about this dichotomy of you know attention intention and and being there, you know, recognizing the, the points at which we're weak uh, in these areas. Um, I think Bhutto does ask the questions. He might do it in a very unconventional way, but it uses movement. This is, I'm, I'm telling you what I think Bhutto is, but you know. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it, yeah. But I think it does, it, it sort of uses movement to describe these things like attention or presence or you know our existence within this bigger framework of of uh what exists you know mm -hmm. so you get a pretty you get a pretty pretty immediate experience of it oh yeah but you don't, you don't really, you, you can, it asks the questions, you know, I, I mean, you, there are many things we could do that ask the questions, but, you know, I think you and I 
maybe of this commonality of <clears throat> using using that mode to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. So anyway, to uh, to asking more questions. And, to asking um, more questions. If we have yeah. design or something, we'll go like ting ting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully, we'll do that in uh, real time and meet space. Eventually, yeah. uh, I'll make it to Seattle. Or you'll you'll come here. We'll do some performances or something. Yeah, we can dance online too. If you have an idea, I'm happy to play around and do something that the it's beautiful that, because you can record like as you are doing like if you do some even ideas that we have we can bounce ideas yeah. and record them i think that's a wonderful idea and we should do that and now mm -hmm. uh, let's let's figure out when yeah ah thank you so much trey thank you so much diana i appreciate your being here and uh, uh Beautiful to talk to you and then remember yeah. our time together with all these wonderful projects that we did. Yeah, 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 foundational stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll say, say hello that. to Nadine. Okay. I was just going to say that you do that to Howard, I'll do that yeah. to Nadine. <laughs> yes. We'll talk yes. Again. And good luck with your, your parents. <laughs> Same to you. <laughs> <laughs> all all right. the best. <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye. Bye for now. Thank you for everything. Thank you.